Welcome to the second session of day two of the Future of the American Child Journalism Training in Charlotte. We, as I've been saying all this past few days, we are the first journalists in the country to have uh, an exclusive briefing on a report called On the Threshold of Change, the Strate Strategies for Transforming Foster Care. This is an important conversation for us to be having because as we've been talking about systemic uh, barriers to child well-being, uh, I think we would all agree that the foster care system uh, is right at the top of the avenues that need to be explored, confronted, and addressed. And we are quite privileged at this point to have the executive director of the Youth Law Center, uh, Jennifer Rodriguez, join us to provide us with that exclusive briefing on this report. So Jennifer, thank you so much for being here. I'm really grateful to be with all of you. I thought that before you get into the details of the report and the presentation that you've prepared for us, it would be important for the journalists to continue this theme of lived experience that we've been exploring with so many of our speakers by hearing about your background in the, the system and uh, what you have come to know about this issue. Absolutely. Um, I'm really happy you're starting with that because I feel like it's such an important part of telling the story of why these issues matter. Um, and I agree with you on the systemic issues. I think foster care and juvenile justice sort of live at the intersection of every systemic problem in our society, whether you're talking about racism or poverty um, or systemic oppression of any kind where we are failing in our society, that's where you see our children show up in these two systems. So um, I tell people all the time, I've now been a lawyer at the Youth Law Center for the past 16 years and I've been the executive director for the past 12. Um, but I started my advocacy career as a child in the system. Um, I just wasn't any good at it <laughs> at that time. Um, my advocacy efforts often ended me locked up in juvenile hall or in a restrictive residential placement. Um, so I learned to take all of those skills in the system and sort of translate them into something that um, could provide a really meaningful career uh, for me. I learned that in law school, you're actually taught how to be manipulative. And I, um, according to the people who raised me in the systems, came with that skill already of getting adults to do what I, I wanted to do. Um, so I spent most of my childhood and um, teen years involved in the system. By the time I was a pretty young teenager, I already um, was in high-level, very restrictive residential placements. I was in um, what was formerly known as group homes um, and then ended up in juvenile hall, in um, shelters. I ended up homeless while I was in care in psychiatric hospitals. So when I hear people now talk about young people with complex needs who they can't figure out and saying like they're worse and they have more problems than they ever were, were did. Um, I have to believe that that, you know, may be how people are interpreting it, but may not be true because people describe me as a child in the system that way. And if we've been accelerating on the number of problems and behaviors that children have, we'd have a whole system full of serial killers at this point, and we don't. Um, so, you know, that was my experience. By the time I turned 18, um, I actually grew up in a time before extended foster care. So on your 18th birthday, um, you were sometimes told happy birthday, often not happy birthday, but you were told to exit the home where you lived. In my case, it was a facility. Um, and so I decided to one up um, and not let anybody tell me goodbye and pack my things in a garbage bag and put me on the porch. But I just left on my own a couple of weeks before my 18th birthday. And I actually came into care from being a kid on the street and went right back into um, being homeless at the age of 18. And so spent the next few months um, trying to figure out how to navigate life with, I had no high school diploma. Um, I had actually moved so many times in foster care that I didn't have a single high school credit. Um, so I didn't have any educational experience to go off of. I had an arrest record, which prevented me from being able to get a job. Um, I had no real work experience while I was in foster care other than a summer digging ditches for the Conservation Corps. Um, in the Bay Area. 
So I, I could dig up a rose garden for you if you wanted, but that didn't really lead to gainful employment or make people thrilled about hiring me. Um, I didn't have a single adult in my life who hadn't been paid to be a part of that. So when I was 18, every relationship I had with an adult ended. My social worker, the lawyer I supposedly had who I had never met, um, the staff that worked in the facility that I lived, they not only did I not have them in my life, but they were under like confidentiality orders that if they saw me in the community, they weren't allowed to acknowledge me by saying hello because that would violate confidentiality. So you can imagine how that makes a child feel. Um, I didn't quite understand the legality of it at that time, but what I thought is I'm not even worth enough for somebody to acknowledge. And that was, I would say all of those things were difficult, but probably the most difficult part for me of exiting foster care was feeling like, you know, the entire time I had been in care, my life was a, a was a disaster. I was a kid who was on psychotropic medications. I was running away um, from placements. And I'd often have adults tell me, it's okay, you'll get out of this system and then your life will be your own life. But when I was 18, it turned out that my life was just as, a as much of a disaster or more because now I didn't have shelter, I didn't have food, I didn't have any of the basic things I needed to survive. And I felt like I was the only person responsible um, for that. So was pretty depressed and hopeless and you know, there's nothing like having to experience your first, um, you know, your 18th birthday is a milestone, but your first Thanksgiving and Christmas and everybody else having a place to be um, and you just being alone to make you feel like, you know, you really don't matter to the society and to the world. Um, luckily for me, I was connected with a program, a federally funded program called Job Corps. Um, and I actually found out about Job Corps because my coping mechanism and my survival strategy had been to be a reader. And so libraries were my friend and kind of my sanctuary. And in the library, I opened up a resource guide and I saw a description of Job Corps that said, you got free housing, free food, vocational training. And I said, I'm in. Um, I will tell you though, I almost didn't get into Job Corps because they have to pull all of your records. Um, to verify their zero, or they were a zero tolerance facility, so they have to verify that you don't have serious mental health issues, that you haven't had um, any interaction with the juvenile justice system, you don't have an arrest record. Um, of course, I had all of the things, but in the time while my records were coming in, I got to be in the office with the, it's called Women in Community Service in California. They're the people that are the gateway into Job Corps. And I had no place to be because I was a homeless kid. And so I got their coffee and I filed their papers and I answered their phones. And the counselor that was working with me, by the time my record started coming in indicating who I was, she said, you know what? I don't want to know anymore. I'm just going to let you in. Um, and I would say that was sort of the first in the you know, step, people will often ask me, well, how'd you get from there to here? And I will tell you it was all relationships and people who did above and beyond. And that actually infuriates me <laughs> because it was not by design um, that a young person like me could find a way to have a second chance and to have the opportunity to become a contributing member of a community. It was all by folks sort of bending a rule or giving me a chance that really I shouldn't have had according to the, the rule book, which is part of what has fueled my desire to do advocacy because every young person should have those opportunities by design. Um, so I got into Job Corps, I got some vocational training. Um, I was actually trained in Job Corps to become a typist for Amtrak. Um, and I tell people this because it ties into um, the, the report that we're releasing. People were preparing me for a future that actually wouldn't exist in a few years as sort of the way um, to livelihood. You know, at that point, Amtrak was not something that was a booming industry. And certainly, computers already existed. So being a typist, like on an actual typewriter, wasn't the thing <laughs> at all. But that's where Job Corps was for vulnerable young people at that time. Um, they were just looking at who they had partnerships with. And 
sort of preparing us for the world. Um, luckily for me, I did get into, I didn't get into a job at Amtrak, I got into a job at a fancy hotel, the Fairmont, who taught me how to speak to fancy people. So got all my sort of facility language and mannerisms right out of me. I was forced to answer a room service phone with a mirror in front of me so that I would smile and, you know, they corrected all my slang. And so I went from, you know, hood to, professional pretty quickly in the period of a year, which was actually, I tell people all the time, that kind of rigorous first work training is something that I lean on today. Um, and so I was really lucky to have a strong first work experience. And from there, I worked for a couple of years and ended up um, signing up for community college because with a GED, there's just not much you can do. Um, and so I intended actually to become a medical assistant because it was the shortest program, six units in community college. I did not see myself as a student and um, ended up having a teacher, a professor at community college talk me into, you know, if you're gonna be a medical assistant, why not be an LVN? If you're gonna be an LVN, why not be an RN? If you're gonna be an RN, she had me going to medical school at which point I was like, why would I ever want to do that? <laughs> um, I'm squeamish. And so I thought about what do I want to do? And what I really wanted to do was make sure that the kind of pathway and experience that I had both growing up in the system, um, where nobody thought about the level of loneliness and kind of desperation and um, you know all of the things that come along with, with those experiences, being trafficked, you know, being um, victimized by other young people, by folks in the home, would, that those things wouldn't happen to anybody else. Um, and so that started my path to, to law school and um, to advocacy. So I feel like I'm doing my dream job and my dream work, but I also meet now too many other young people who have almost identical experiences to the ones that I had decades later. Um, exiting out with no adult connections, with no connection to the community, with nobody thinking about how all of the ways that the world is changing might impact them. Everything from, you know, climate changes to, um, you know, the, the fact that many young people now will not even have a human being as their first uh, supervisor in a job. They may actually be supervised by an algorithm. Um, you know, folks are not thinking about how those things impact our young people who are really the most vulnerable. And so that leads, I think, right to this um, report and the opportunity to release it all to you today. And it is a North Star report. I want to start by saying that it lays out a vision rather than a set of action items. Um, and we felt like that was really important because the Youth Law Center, where um, a national advocacy organization. Our focus is on using the law to protect and advance the civil rights of young people who are in foster care in the juvenile justice system. And, you know, we can use the law in all kinds of ways, litigation, policy reform, um, collaborative system change. It's amazing how many systems want to work with us when they know that our other options are more punitive and directive. Um, but without knowing what you're trying to design and what you're really trying to build and without thinking about all of the systemic issues, you can use the law in a way that actually solidifies the systemic problems in the system and sort of bolsters them because as you tinker with things. And so we really wanted to take a step back on this report and think about that it's equally important to think about what you're trying to build um, as it is to dismantle what you don't want. Um, so that brings us to the report today. I usually wait till the end of a, of a session to ask for applause, but... <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Again, another powerful example of lived experience and what a difference it makes in the lives of a community, of a group of people, when the people making decisions speaking for them, advocating them, actually know what they went through. So at that note, I'm gonna let you take it away. Okay, terrific. Thank you, Rachel. So let's see, so I have a, a lengthy PowerPoint here um, that I wanna just say in advance, you all will be provided. I'm not gonna go through all of the slides today, but I did wanna make sure that you all knew that those slides are um, are there and available for you. So 
as I mentioned before, this, um, this report is really about um, visioning what it is that we need to do to change extended foster care and the supports that we provide young people who are transitioning out of foster care so that they can thrive by 2035. Um, and so it's a step back from a typical policy report. What we did when we started thinking about the fact that, um, as you heard in the last presentation, Charles mentioned that during the pandemic, what was exposed were a lot of fissures in the system that are always there, they always exist. But what we realize is that young people are entirely unprepared um, for the era that we're currently living in and even more unprepared for what's coming in the next, the next decade. So um, I wanna just start by telling you a little bit about young people who enter into extended foster care, who they are and some of the challenges that they face. And the most important thing for you to know is that extended foster care was designed for young people who the system failed. I mean, really, there is one primary job that child welfare systems have when they have children in their care, and that is to make sure that either they return to their own natural family or they are brought into a family um, that is, becomes their own family. So, you know, that is, the, that is the one job of the child welfare system. And so for these young people, these are young people who the system has not found a family for, who will be exiting out into adulthood without the support um, of, you know, folks who will provide a buffer from all of, the, all of the things that are happening in the world, who will provide concrete financial support, emotional support. You know, there are so few 18-year-olds who are on their own that back in 2008, when Congress was thinking about this, they were wondering how on earth does an 18-year-old navigate completely alone? And, you know, I can raise my hand and say not very well. Um, <laughs> that was my experience. The other thing to know about who these young people are is that 75% of them are young people of color. It is not everybody equally that the child welfare system fails to connect with family, reunify with their own family. So think of it sort of as a funnel. And by the time you get to young people who are at their 18th birthday, now their 21st birthday, there is a particular group of young people that we have very poorly served. Um, and you know, Congress at the time spotted it was not just young people of color, it was also other discrete subgroups. So it was young people who had experience in both foster care and juvenile justice systems. It was young people who had significant health needs, whether those were mental health needs or physical health needs. It was young people who were expectant or parenting. Those are all young people who are overrepresented in this population of youth who are exiting um, into extended foster care. So in 2008, Congress responded and they gave states the option to use federal dollars to pay for a share of extension of foster care up to the age of 21. Um, as you heard earlier, California, we like to pride ourselves on being first in line to implement reform. And so um, in, two, in 2010, California took advantage of that option. We implemented a statute in our state that took advantage of that federal option. Um, and I was part of the design during that time of what it would look like. What we tried to do was to make it have as few sort of um, conditions as possible for young people. Um, earlier, there was a, a question from one of the fellows about the punitive nature of extended foster care. And because it is a sort of public benefit driven program, um, there was so much desire to put along all of the punitive conditions that come with that. So young people would not be eligible if they dropped out of school or if they failed to comply with the conditions. Um, sort of all of the same rhetoric that causes problems in the system now and that you know, often doesn't give young people the opportunity to do the work of adolescence, of, of failing and making mistakes and learning from those mistakes. We tried to build it out so that as many youth as possible could just stay in, that it would become the system's responsibility to make them eligible. Um, and they could re-enter as many times as they wanted to re-enter. They could cho choose to say, I'm done with the system, I wanna try things on my own, and then they could come back in. Um, a number of other states followed suit, um, and at this point in time, 
We now have about 33 states across the country who have implemented this federal option um, to use federal dollars, and we have another 20-something who are doing their own thing with their own state dollars. So the majority of the country has some option for young people to stay into foster care till the age of 21. So there have been real positive impacts with this, very tangible um, improvements for the lives of young people in foster care. And it's very interesting because they are very strong and isolated in particular areas. This three additional years to work with young people has resulted in much lower rates of homelessness among young people, much higher rates of finishing high school, of enrolling in post-secondary education, of being able to access post-secondary educational aid. Um, it's actually decreased the birth rate among young women in foster care who, um, the birth rate was actually fairly high. Pre previously, it was over 50% of young women would have a baby before the age of 21. It, just keeping them in care um, and being able to provide three more years of foster care has decreased that, um, that birth rate. And what we have seen is that, and, and also economic stability. That's the other area where there has been a huge um, increase in positive outcomes for young people. However, when we originally designed extended foster care, what we, in California at least, what we visioned was something that was entirely different from foster care as it operated. We wanted to really include adolescent brain development science that tells us that young people need the opportunity to have a lot of freedom, a lot of flexibility. We wanted to make sure that that three more years was focused on system. You have three more years to get this young person connected with as many adults who will love them as possible. And people basically forgot about that outcome. You know, they focused on the independence rather than the interdependence that young people and adults that all of us really need to survive. And again, which got highlighted so starkly during the pandemic. Um, so what we have seen is not improve, we've seen no improvements in the rates of young people who get connected with family. Um, during that, that three years. We've also seen no impact in things around young people's rate of getting victimized in relationships um, and having child welfare involvement with their own children. And I will tell you as somebody who experienced the system that this to me is one of the biggest failures of the system. I think there is nothing those of us who grew up in the system want more than to end the generational cycle and do better by our own children. You know, I tell people all the time that my own two children are the most important sort of thing that will represent whether I've been able to heal and have a better life as possible. I've also got teens, one of which um, just started college, and so it feels full circle for me um, to, to feel like I have actually been able to provide my children a life where they are able to have all the things that I did not have, and I want that for every young person who's exiting out of care. Um, so for this project, we decided we wanted to take this step back, and we wanted to do two things. First of all, we wanted to understand what the next decade looked like. Um, and you know, I think this is probably a common sentiment on everyone who experienced the pandemic and everything that followed is like, whoa, what is coming next? So we really felt like for this group of young people, we need to really understand what is coming next so that we can make sure that they are prepared to, you know, at a basic level, survive it, but at an ideal level that they're, provide, they're prepared to thrive in it. And for that, we brought in the Institute for the Future, which are futurists. They're folks who are trained in foresight. Um, we were actually their first project that, you know, had anything to do with system-involved young people. They typically have worked with the labor markets, with healthcare foundations, looking at the future of work, the future of healthcare, the future of family. Um, and so we brought them in because we felt like they would help us understand both what's coming, but their specialty is in helping people understand that the future doesn't just happen to you, that you build the future that you wanna build. And then we brought in young people who had been system impacted with a youth advocacy group called the California Youth Connection because we also believe that if you're building a future, it needs to be designed and blueprinted by the folks who are gonna live that future. Um, so together with these two groups, 
we worked over the past two years on developing a model and this um, framework for extended foster care in the future. Um, and what we have come up with is this pretty long 62 page report that you all have a link to both this and the executive summary in your materials. And it lays out um, several sections. One is helping folks understand what are the harsh realities for young people who are in extended foster care today. Because it's really important to understand what young people are living with today as we think about what the future we want to design is. Um, and so I'll talk very briefly about each of those areas and you can find more information in your background. So the very first area is what, um, what I mentioned before, which is how critical it is in this time to make sure that every young person has the buffer protection, the security of family. And that essentially what the young people we worked with believed was that this period of time needs to be looked at as sort of the last and best chance for the child welfare system to make sure that they are connected with, um, with people that are gonna be their buffer. Um, in their world and that are gonna be natural supports that they won't age out of. They want folks who will be there at their wedding, who will walk them down the aisle, who will be there as natural supports when their own children are born, who will protect them from you know, the racism, from the economic instability in the world. Um, so what we know is that right now in extended foster care, the policies and practices we use, they often weaken family relationships. And again, there was the, the question about some of the housing policies. And one example of that is, you know, across the country, we see housing programs that serve, for example, young women who are parenting, um, who have a child. And many of those programs actually prohibit the other parent, um, the father, from living in the home with the young person. So we've just recently fixed this by policy in California, but there are many other states where where this practice continues and we see families kind of separated. And again, this goes back to the history of so many of our other public benefit programs where we really isolate mothers and, and their children. And these are young people who may not have any other support network other than the person that they're co-parenting with. Um, we also now have this really, really strong um, body of research that tells us that actually relational health and relational poverty are both the number one strategy to improve the lives of folks who are suffering, including our young people, and also the number one issue. So actually the American Academy of Pediatrics last year issued um, a statement saying that, you know, uh, children not having strong, enduring, supportive relationships is a public health emergency, and that it not only results in the emotional problems and the instability that we would expect, but it actually results in all kinds of health problems for these children as they become adults. So everything from heart disease to diabetes to obesity to you know every kind of serious health condition under the sun, they are linking back to folks not having the loving support of family. Um, so we really feel like in this, in this report, we make the case that we need to be looking at interdependence. We need to be looking at family um, during this period. And that actually it's a great opportunity with so many young people being out in the world for the first time or having their own children to reintroduce this idea of even if you don't want family for yourself, like if you don't feel like you're deserving and worthy, and I would put myself in that category. I actually felt so broken by the time that I was 18 that I didn't think I could be loved by anybody. But when I had my first child, I desperately wanted my first child to have grandparents and aunts and uncles and to have that assurance that if something happened to me, they wouldn't end up right back in the system that I grew up in. So it's a real opportunity. Um, Racial injustice. So we know, I, I think it's no surprise to anybody that basically all of the work in child welfare is um, by its nat nature either racial justice work or racial injustice work because not every child ends up in the foster care system. So sort of racism embeds um, by design every element of the way that we practice child welfare and you have to make the kind of active efforts that you heard about earlier to undo and address those, um, 
those practices to be healthy. What we know is this is no different in extended foster care. We've heard from so many young people that um, policies and practices in extended foster care are not only not designed um, for young people of color, and these are particular issues, I think, for, um, for black young people, for native young people, and for our young people who speak a different language. So in extended foster care, there is everything from policies that prohibit young people from speaking their language of choice to connecting with their culture. Um, but actually, they're not only not designed for them and to help them succeed, but they often undermine um, their sort of desire to be in touch with their culture and practice. And we also know all the data tells us that youth of color experience disproportionately precarious rates of housing instability. Um, in, for example, in California, where we do have more housing for this age of population than I think most um, states do across the country, we see involuntary exit rates of about 30% in some of those programs. Um, and that is because young people are not following the rules in the program. So not because they can't benefit, um, but because many of those program rules actually end up harming and punishing um, young people of color in a particular way. Um, economic inequality. What we know is that the goal in extended foster care is actually to manage assets and to make sure that youth don't have too many assets um, rather than trying to help them grow the assets that they need for both short and long term financial stability. And this really showed up in COVID-19 when so many young people, like within the course of a month, actually became homeless when they lost their job. They were not only living paycheck to paycheck, they were living sort of like housing situation to next housing situation. Um, and you know, all of the work that we did that you'll read about in this report tells us that this is not, the, the pandemic was not the last thing that we are expecting to face over the next decade. Um, in California, as in many parts of the country, we have faced climate disasters that have forced young people to relocate um, very quickly and disrupted their school, their employment, their housing situation. So we really have to be thinking about how they can weather those economic crises. Um, I just mentioned this. What I also want to say about the climate crisis is, is we know from the research that these kind of crises are impacting the mental health of folks who are vulnerable, particularly women, um, at a rate that it is not impacting the rest of the population. So low income women are particularly harmed. Um, and now we're getting increasing data about the impact on the mental health of young people, teens overall, teens and young adults. Um, in, around distress around the crisis. As you can imagine, since so many young people who are in extended foster care have no sort of emergency plan, no safety net, emergency services and states are not thinking about this population. They don't have family across the country that they can go live with. Um, this is a particular issue for them. And then the digital divide. So in foster care, technology is often seen as contraband. Um, so many young people, there's huge debates around whether young people are allowed access to social media, whether they can be you know, sort of online, um, doing the same things that other teens are doing. Many of our young people actually leave foster care with only having sort of discrete hidden opportunities to utilize um, technology. And so with none of the digital dexterity that both people really need to survive, but also that could create livelihoods for our young people. Um, it's, you know, we're in a time now where they can become influencers or bloggers if they know how to do this. And I think, you know, one of the things I see so often with our young people, I'm still in touch with many of them, is that they don't understand the importance of sort of maintaining a positive online presence. And so often that's their only outlet to vent and they're sharing information that they probably don't want their next employer or their college or the parent of the person they're dating um, to read about their life. And we now know you can't get rid of that information sort of ever completely. So it's creating a, a situation where young people's past will follow them in ways that they don't understand yet. Um, and then social volatility. We know there's a disproportionate number of LGBTQ um, youth, of youth who have been impacted by immigration, young people of color. We're now sort of in an era where 
these young people feel under fire are so much so. And again, part of the reason that our young people feel so strongly about needing the protection of family is they don't have that buffer and safe space that other young people may um, have to feel like they belong and they're protected. So the transformational forces of tomorrow. Um, I just want to say that as we were thinking about this work, what we you know, really wanted to harness was this is um, a really famous foresight thinker who, her quote here, remember to imagine and craft the world you can't live without um, while you're dismantling the ones you can't live within. I think so much of, our, of the advocacy work in our field focuses on um, dismantling the things that don't work. And, and honestly, the reporting does as well, you know, highlighting the things that are going badly and where we really fall short is reimagining what, what is the alternative that we want that won't just be a little bit like, won't be less bad than what we have, that would actually be good for our young people. Um, and so that's what this work is about, is saying what's the future we're trying to create and how can we start moving in that direction. Um, so this report focuses on these four forces and thinking about by 2035, if we had an entirely different extended foster care system, um, we would have a system that had equitable transitions where the system would be guaranteeing income, guaranteeing housing, rather than placing the burden on young people um, to maintain eligibility and then seek out things that would be focused on restorative care. So we'd be looking at a holistic kind of um, creative approach to maintaining young people's well-being and health rather than a crisis um, focus where we step in when a young person is in the middle of a breakdown. Um, we would have relational design permeate everything we did um, in extended foster care with the number one goal being making sure that we are maintaining and adding to the number of lifelong strong relationships a young person has and that we'd be giving young people computational advantage. And I think that the best way managing time here. The best way to probably give you an introduction to what this would look like is to show you this film, which I will say was um, co-designed with young people and is, uh, actually has voice talent, all young people who have experienced extended foster care. Like I'm about to start a big new chapter in my life. I'm doing really good in my life right now. I'm super happy. I've been playing sports. I've been making more lifelong connections. Everything in my life is going pretty well. What if we look out 10 years into the future into an extended foster care system that supports loving familial relationships, financial security, and a sense of hope and wonder for the youth it's designed to assist? We'd like to invite you into these two stories optimistic future visions about two siblings who have come out of the foster care system and are not just barely making it, but they are well on their way to meaningful, joy-filled lives. The year is 2035. Our first story is a story of hope. Being a parent myself now, certain things are still hard to figure out. Right now, it's sleep training. She's been waking every hour and a half. Hi, baby. It's okay. Mommy's here. Thank you so much. I'll be back up in an hour. I never knew how good it would feel to live in a building full of family. Birth family, chosen family, loving families. We have each other's backs. In 2035, young people in extended foster care are embedded in networks of families, friends, and communities that celebrate victories and provide love, guidance, and support when they face challenges. This would be an extended foster care that embraces the principles of relational design, which prioritize relational permanency, measured by quality, durability, and the quantity of connections that young people have. Now that I can make these choices, I can make sure I've got the right child care for my baby. And that's my aunt. She takes care of a few kids, and I know she'll always have my child's best interest in mind. 
and my EFC benefits provide a stipend for her to watch the kids, which she does just downstairs on the main floor of the co-op. Good morning. Ugh, it was another rough night. How did you make it through sleep training? Bye, baby. I'll see you after work. Love you, auntie. It's so helpful to have our services all in one place. With driverless vehicles, it's so much simpler to get to work than it was with our old bus passes. I'm still working through certain anxiety being around certain strangers I don't know. So having the option to order a car like this is so helpful. In 2035, young people in extended foster care will have automatic access to creative services, supports, and interventions across the mental health continuum. This would be an extended foster care that incorporates a broader set of conditions that support lifelong well-being through restorative care. Neurotherapy, which is a combination of neuroscience and psychology, has uncovered a lot of promising treatments. I want to be a neurotherapist, and I'm taking classes both at home and at university. My mentor helps me too. And I can do this at times that work best for me being with my kid. It'll take a few months, maybe years, but I'll get there, and I'm making progress. Our second story, a safe harbor in the storm. The storms and fires were bad and we had to evacuate. Because I had everyone's location, we were so well connected. A van arrived, it was driving by itself to pick us up and take us to safety. My sister and a few friends were at this housing co-op and I was able to relocate because of that. It's like extended foster care finally realized that being climate ready is more than just giving us temporary shelter. We need help with all the other stuff that gets disrupted, like school and work and money. And so it's better now that once we're in the system, stuff is automatically connected to us without us having to fill out new forms or wait to talk to a new social worker before we go to our next transitional housing. In 2035, sophisticated AI curate and tailor an optimal set of supports based on each young person's circumstances, interests, and plans for the future. This would be an extended foster care that applies a more informed and thoughtful approach to the role of technology so that young people have a computational advantage when they exit foster care and are ready to use the quickly advancing technologies such as AI as a tool to achieve their preferred futures. And we might need to talk to someone, like a therapist or someone else that's professional. For some of my friends, these earthquakes and fires really, really freak them out, so they might need a little bit of support. I love living here for so many reasons. When I shared, I like to stay and make this my permanent home, my social worker connected me with representatives from the housing co-op. She explained to me that I could buy into the co-op. Can you believe that? It was designed for young people who don't have much money or family support, just like me. In 2035, guaranteed housing and income is recognized as an investment that contributes to the economic and housing security of youth long after they have left extended foster care. This would be an extended foster care that views these comprehensive supports as fundamental for just equitable transitions out of the system and essential for young people to flourish in adulthood. It's nice to have my own place, but also good to be close to family. I can't believe that this all happened after going through what I went through. But we're finally here and I have my sister just next door. I have a new house that has all the decorations that I need. I feel like I'm finally thriving. So much has changed in these past few months especially having my sibling move in next door and owning so close to me. Like my baby is now sleep trained. You stayed in your bed all night. Good job, baby. And my baby's father is able to visit and be part in their life. It's a new starting preschool, auntie. Can you believe it? Thank you so much for everything. We'll see you after school. It's felt like a long road sometimes. Life hasn't always been easy on me, but I'm here. I'm so proud I did it. Like anyone, I needed support along the way, and now I'm in a position to lead a meaningful, productive, and joyful life. In 2035, 
young people in extended foster care are bolstered by the support of many caring adults to see the goodness and strength in themselves and the world around them, to live without limits in a rapidly changing world. So I hope that that helped you sort of understand at a visualization level these restorative um, future forces that we feel like could really transform extended foster care. Probably much better than me going through them on the slides. I'm just going to put up the last, the last, go back to the last um, slide so that folks have contact information. There we go. So, um, so that you know. All of these, the way that we develop the transformative forces, we're actually looking at signals in the current time of folks who are living the future. And so we did a lot of scans of things that are happening outside of extended foster care that we believe could be um, part of the future design now. So everything from black worker hubs to um, folks who are prescribing doctors who are now prescribing time in nature um, as a treatment for uh, well-being, um, to co-housing that is being developed in different communities for folks who um, could use the support of community in growing, to programs that are focusing on addressing relational poverty by ensuring that everything that gets done gets done with the idea of building connections and family um, as the number one goal. So let me get here to the end. There we go. Um, yeah. I noted that Maraba wanted to applaud again. Oh, good. <laughs> I, I think we're we're on a trend here. Uh, let's let's uh, try try to uh, get some questions in if we can. Yes. So I'll join you back up front. Great. Does anyone have a question for Jennifer or comment? <clears throat> Hi, I'm Danae King. I'm a reporter with the Columbus Dispatch in Ohio, and I I'm just curious. Like after seeing that video, what is the way that you can kind of build and nurture those relationships? Like, how do you find those adults who are going to be there for somebody um, and make sure that is continuous? So, you know, this is just an extension of what Charles touched on earlier. I guarantee you by the time our young people have been on the earth for 18 years, they have run into people who care about them and love them. And we have all of the technology at our hands to find our first boyfriend from middle school. So we should be able to find <laughs> all of those folks for our young people. It could be anyone from a third grade teacher to the parents of, of a best friend um, to you know, somebody that they went to church with. There are people who care about these young people and most likely had no idea that they were in foster care. Um, you know, I'll tell you a quick, a quick story for me was that when I was mid 20s, um, and family finding and engagement had just come to California. Um, you know, the, the person, Kevin Campbell, who was sort of pioneering it, piloted it, ran it on me, and was able to find um, a ton of my paternal family who my father was incarcerated. And so they just never knew what happened to me and assumed that I had been with my mother all of those years. And so it was really unsettling to me. And my, the narrative I had in my head was nobody wanted me. Um, and that's what I sort of held in my identity. And then I met all these folks in my mid-20s who were like, we had no idea. Like, we're so sorry. I actually couldn't reconcile it at that point. I had no support. But, um, you know, some research, there was a California Permanency for Older Youth Project. What they found is if they just had more time while young people were in foster care to do the kind of casework to help the young person heal, to help the family heal, to bring people together, they'd be able to strengthen 
that. Um, and people love our young people. Like I think that folks, you know, they they watch t they watch Special Victims Unit, and somebody has always been in foster care who's the perp, right? And they read sto media stories sometimes that are pretty scary about young people, and they're scared of them. And then when they get to meet them in person, they're like, "I love this young person. Can I, like, I want to be your everything." Um, and so. The more we create opportunities in the community for folks to interact with our, so that's mentorships, you know, job programs, getting faith-based institutions to sponsor birthday parties and baby showers, we can be working on making new connections for them as well. This vision is awesome, but how do you adjust a staffing model, a funding model, a sort of vision of collective social responsibility? that is the bridge from where we are to where you'd like us to be. Yeah, I mean, I think you're, what you're pinpointing is that this is about a, a culture change of thinking. I mean, what we know from the brain science is that actually the period of adolescence is equally as important as that early, that first five years of development because it's a use it or lose it time, right? And we need everyone to understand, oh, this is a critically important time and that the responsibility lies in the community. That's the culture shift. The only way we're gonna get there is through incremental changes that are building in that direction. So I think there are some things that can happen at the federal level and there are things that can happen at the state level too. At the federal level, you know, uh, removing eligibility conditions, making some of these things just guaranteed, guaranteed income, you know, guaranteed housing, more flexible funding to do, th those will go a long way at the state level. Um, you know, looking at things like who can actually administer extended foster care as a program. Does it belong? In California, we also serve um, probation supervised youth who are in extended foster care. And so often our young people, the support that they have is a law enforcement officer with a gun on their hip showing up in their supervised independent living placement to check in with them. And, and they often do very law enforcement-like things like pee test them every time they're there to make sure they're not violating the terms of probation or um, using substance abuse. So maybe neither child welfare or probation agency should be running this program. Maybe it should be somebody in the community like the YMCA, um, somebody who's really youth development oriented. Right now, the way we've structured at the state level often does not give child welfare agencies who may already be dealing with staffing pressures and you know, a lot of workers don't come in to child welfare because they really wanna work with teens. They come in because they're thinking of children. So often our child welfare agencies struggle with teens. Um, Agencies might like to contract that function out, but can't do that right now. Um, so that might be another example of the kind of policy that could move us in that, that direction. Any other? Hi, um, along with USA Today, thank you so much for the presentation. It was really powerful. Um, years and years ago, when I was doing some reporting on the foster care system, it felt like there was really an emphasis on um, establishing boundaries between the um, bio family and the foster family. Um, and it's really refreshing to hear that there's this emphasis now on the co-parenting model and on building those relationships and ensuring that if, if, if it's you know reasonable that the child has that connection to the bio parents. And I'm wondering um, if you can share what the challenges have been in, in um, that co-parenting model and what some of the policy reforms can be to, to um, enable that. And if you're comfortable sharing, and you kind of touched on this a little earlier, but I'm wondering if you were ever able to connect with your bio family and your parents. Yeah, so I'm gonna step outside this report and project a little bit and tell you another um, system change project that the Youth Law Center administers is something called the Quality Parenting Initiative. And so we're working in about uh, 12 states currently and 80 jurisdictions across the country to reorient child welfare around the primary goal being every child receiving excellent, loving parenting, rather than in many agencies, the goal is to not have a child be re-abused or die. And that's a really depressing goal. Um, it's sort of avoiding a liability kind of goal. Um, and so one of the primary um, things that we do is we say, what are the barriers in your system to children getting parent, excellent, loving parenting? And every single agency that we've worked with over the past, 
goodness, we've been doing this work now for 14 years, has identified systemic barriers that prevent birth parents and foster parents from working together. And you know what there is is often an adversary kind of culture. And so some of the very specific sort of changes that agencies have made to facilitate those contacts are, for example, every single one of our QPI sites now does what's called a comfort call. Um, and that is when the child is placed in the home of a resource caregiver, the worker immediately makes a call to the birth parent and says, I'm placing this child in, in Heather's home. I wanna tell you a little bit about her family. And is there anything you'd like to share with Heather to help her care for your child? Like, is she scared of the dark? Is there a favorite food? Um, you know, is there a nickname that, that you use? To start from the very beginning, developing that sort of partnership between, um, and then agencies are doing icebreaker kind of meetings that are focused around the child between the birth parent and the foster parent within the first few days and changing like visitation that typically happens, which is you know, a, a monthly or a weekly meeting to family time meetings, um, where the resource parents are now being trained to bring the birth parents into their home and have them involved in cooking dinner or giving baths or putting the child down. What it turns out across all of our sites, the primary barrier is actually not what everyone thinks it is, which is resistance of the foster parents or resistance of the birth parents. It's resistance of the workers. Um, workers are very scared. Agencies are very scared about liability. It sort of requires them to, to say we're not the ones that have the control and the power at this point. They can imagine everything that can go wrong, and there are a lot of things that can go wrong. And we've even had in, in Florida, soon after we um, implemented this, there, there was a serious incident where a birth parent ended up kidnapping a, a child. And, you know, and, and these things may happen, um, but they would happen with, with or without the sort of co-parenting work, likely. Um, and so it's been working with county council, it's been working with parents council, with the courts, to help them understand what we're trying to do and why this is so important for the child. I mean, the child cannot feel like the adults that love them most are adversary, because then they feel like they can't connect in the way that they need to connect. And our number one goal is always to get children back at home with their natural family. And so if we do this right, it means when children reunify back with their family, that that parent has a natural support system now with the resource families. We've heard so many beautiful stories from our sites around resource families remaining involved for years, um, you know, having Christmases together, taking the child when the parent is under stress, um, you know, without the system being involved at all. It, it, to me, I always think about it's building the world that I want to live in, you know, where we actually have folks who are naturally supporting each other and, you know, our reentry rates are often really high um, in a lot of sites and places that are doing this well, the former foster parent becomes sort of a, um, you know, a, a safety net so you don't have to have the child reenter the system formally. Unless there are any last questions, I wanted to end on what I think is the most powerful and poignant moment in your introductory remarks when you said that as a, a teen in the system, when you spoke up, when you objected, when you pointed out things that were not right, it was a problem. People branded you as a problem child and it was a negative mark uh, on you. That very energy and spirit was what it required for you to be who you are today. And I think the most powerful message to send to journalists, that journalists can send to communities, is we have to stop turning our back on what youth in the foster care system are enduring and experiencing and thinking they'll figure it out or it's somebody else's problem. We lose too many young people who have the potential and the power and the, the, uh, the purpose of this woman who's sitting across from me because we simply assume that they're gonna figure it out. They're gonna, they're gonna have to figure it out because it's not my problem. So I just want to take this opportunity to thank you for giving us this exclusive briefing on this report, but also, again, for modeling for us the power that it 
that occurs when it's a woman at the table, when it's a woman <laughs> making the policy decisions, but uh, when it's a woman who has lived experience who is helping us navigate these issues. So let's take this opportunity to thank Jennifer Rodriguez for joining us. Thank you.